um, it's time to commence the meeting and we have a quorum. Please sit at your own seat since we'll be able to use electronic voting. Item 1, um, information papers issued after the previous meeting. The Secretariat has issued 12 information papers after the October 11th meeting. Any questions? I, um, agenda item 2. Um, Items for discussion at the next meeting, please refer to paper number CP bracket 4227. The next meeting will be held on December 19th. It's a Wednesday, 1045 in the morning. Well, um, Mr. Holden Chow, I'll let you speak after I have finished with this agenda item. So for the Next meeting, we are going to discuss two items. One, reform of the regulatory regime for local pleasure vessels and enhanced life jacket provision on local vessels and safety measures during major events at sea and revisions to the speed restricted zones for vessels. And second, proposed establishment changes upon the disbandment of the task force on reform in the Marine Department. Do members agree to these two items being discussed? Yes, uh, Mr. Ho Din Chow. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I agree with the arrangements of the meeting, but I would just like to say that uh, you have already received my letter, Chairman. I hope that uh, uh, you would. Uh, Try, uh, we could try to discuss um, in this panel on adding in more uh, retail shops um, in the uh, on the side of Hong Kong port because you know holidays are coming up. I hope that you would discuss with the administration to see whether we could put this item up for discussion as soon as possible. Well, I see that uh, you won't be able to arrange it for the next m meeting. Um, I'm not objecting to the items for discussion. I just hope that you will be able to try to um, discuss with the administration as soon as possible on this re item. Yes, I have received your letter. The administration has responded um, that um, they are going to try to arrange for more retail in the port area as soon as possible. Well, we have already uh, sent your letter to the administration and we could see whether they have a written response first. And if there is a need, then we could discuss this. Uh, Mr. Yu Si Wei, I also agree with uh, Mr. Chow's comment. Uh, Christmas and Chinese New Year are coming up. And I think everyone in Hong Kong is very concerned with the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge situation. I think uh, we should put this item up for discussion as soon as possible, Chairman. Yes, um, I will ask the Secretariat to follow up with the administration. Well, I don't think uh, there should be too many conflicts in relation to the items put up for discussion at the next meeting. If we have time, maybe we could also put this up for discussion. Any questions? If no other questions, then we can move on to agenda item three, um, proposed retention of one supernumerary post of administrative officer staff grade B in the Civil Aviation Department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
So we have with us today Mr. Wallace Lau, Deputy Secretary for Transport and Housing, Mr. Simon Lee, Director General of Civil Aviation, as Ms. Linda So, Deputy Director General of Civil Aviation. So this item is to talk about a proposed retention of one supernumerary post um, at the Civil Aviation Department to continue to strengthen the senior management of the CAD for taking forward various major initiatives as well as sustaining the enhancement of overall administrative control and management in the CAD. May now invite uh, Mr. Lee to go through the paper with us first. Thank you. The CAD suggests um, to retain one supernumerary post of administrative officer staff grade B in the Civil Aviation Department uh, for six years um, until March 31st. Um, and this is um, um, to extend it um, for six more years. And so we hope that uh, we will be able to enhance the um, the senior management um, initiatives as well as to work in over administrative control such as uh, working on the um, third runway to try to uh, work also on the um, UAS um, and also on administrative supervision and regulatory regime of UAS and amendment exercises on aviation related legislation. So after uh, we're able to retain this post, then another officer will be able to work um, solely on um, technical issues, uh, such as trying to uh, look into maintenance and administrative control to ensure that the airport will be able to um, comply with international standards and for um, smooth operations of the airport. So uh, for details, uh, please look through the paper and I would call upon uh, members uh, to agree to this proposed retention of supernumerary post for six more years. Thank you. We now have uh, five members who would like to speak. Um, first, Mr. Ho Din Chow. Thank you. Well, I have two questions. First of all, I see in this uh, that's for this post you're looking for an ex extension uh, for six more years. Well, s since we all know that the third runway after um, its commencing operation in 2024, there would be a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, you're suggesting to extend it for six years. Have you considered trying to make this post permanent? Because, frankly speaking, um, work will only a workload will only increase with the um, operation of the third runway, and F and operations will only become more difficult. Uh, so, would you consider making this post permanent? That is my first question. Uh, my second question is that in Oriental Daily on October 11th, there was a report that the CAD has um, seen um, huge turnover. Um, men, uh, many staff members left. And so in order to um, ensure that there will be enough officers, um, you need to look for external recruitment. So can you tell us about the situation? Is there really such a problem? Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Lee, two questions. Chairman, on making this post permanent, I would like to say that um, if we need to create a new permanent post, um, then it would need public funding and therefore we have to be very prudent in our decision. From now until end of 2024, before the third runway is completed, um, there is an increase in workload that needs to be handled um, by um, this post. So um, and already the um, finance committee has already approved 1.9 billion um, for um, looking to new air control system and also around uh, 2.95 billion on um, increasing uh, uh, facilities. 
and also that includes um, also UAS uh, regulatory regime as mentioned in the paper. Oh, before the end of the uh, six years um, due, then of course we are going to reconsider whether there is such a need to extend the post. Um, for the um, turnover rate, well, actually we're talking about a um, only we only lack four percent um, of staff in air control. Or as I've said, the number is very low. It's only three to four percent. As for hiring overseas. Um, people before the com we commence using the third runway in order to enhance our airport competitiveness. Uh, we have to um, enhance um, our uh, um, cap capability. Therefore, we need more staff, and um, it also takes a long time for us uh, to recruit um, trainers. Therefore, we have this um, overseas um, plan to try to um, make sure that we're able to uh, keep up with this development. Mr. Yu Wing. Well, the third runway will be in operation in 2024, and therefore you need uh, someone to continue to help with the work in order for us to have it scheduled to open in 2024. I support this, but I share the member's view. A lot of the work is actually some work that you have to do it daily, and that is you have to help the director and also to take share the work of an other AD. And in the coming six years, the work will be complex and professional. After six years, if you have to come back, why don't you systematize the work and just create the post of DD? Can you not consider doing it? And secondly, in para 23, you say that you have 120 non-directorate time-limited posts. The director said that you would review manpower. However, you have 120, and you can't just say at one go whether you need them or not need them. When are you going to do the review? So there will be good interfacing of work, and also that these people can be assigned different posts or be sent away. This is a number of 120. Number three, about the unmanned aircraft control and optimizing regulation about these. As you know, at a Hong Kong tourism board activity, there was hacking when a, U, uh, a drone display or show was scheduled. I'd like to ask you, with regard to UAS, apart from controlling the use of drones, what about interference or hacking? Will you also consider future shows so that they will not be interfered with? Director, thank you for the questions. First, making this pose permanent. I think I already explained. We have to abide by the principle of making the best use of public money. But we'll make sure that before the six years are over, we'll review the manpower demand and organization structure of the CAD. Para 23, let me explain. The paper says there are about 120 non-directorate civil servant posts of various grades, and they are time limited. But uh, I think there is some problem here. Maybe it's because of translation. This is not time limited, actually. These are permanent posts. Sorry, I'd like to correct that, please. 
As for UAS, can I ask Ms. So to give you more information? Thank you for the question. With regard to UAS, now if we talk about interference with UAS, under the Telecommunications Ordinance, there are already regulations against interference and also there are penalties. But as Mr. Yu said, there are more and more drones uh, and, and we can expect more interference. Therefore, when we formulate the UAS regulatory system, we will discuss with the Telecommunications Authority. The details will be submitted when we have the actual proposal. Next, Michael Locke. One of the work of the DD is to increase administrative supervision and also to review manpower. Now you are going to engage 40 air traffic controllers who are not directorate posts. I'd like to ask about these 40 posts. Will you be recruiting from universities and vocational training institutes? Because they would have to train up the people for you. Are their ATOs leaving the post because then you will need new blood? So. What are you doing about training? Secondly, para 13. It is said that you will relax the proficiency requirement of Chinese. I'd like to know why. Is it that you need to import these ATOs or are you going to recruit foreigners? Or is it that only overseas countries can train up these people so they do not have a high proficiency of Chinese. Why do you want to relax it? Because then it may be difficult for them to communicate with local ATOs. And because of that, um, some less than ideal situations can arise. Director, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the questions. Regarding the 40 ATOs, when we recruit ATOs, we resort to a series of training programs, some formulated by the CAD. The training courses are run by ourselves, but some training courses are done overseas because we cooperate with New Zealand and the UK. We have an agreement with them. So we can send our staff to their training centers. All ATO trainees are appraised and it takes them two to three years before they can get the first license and work. As for relaxing Chinese language proficiency, experience tells us that on a, a yearly basis, many people come along Four or five thousand of them apply. Every time we recruit 20 to 30 persons. But we found that in order to get suitable personnel, there is difficulty. Some people meet the requirements, but they do not have enough Chinese. Some of them have studied overseas even if they are from Hong Kong. Even before they finish secondary school, they might have gone overseas. So they cannot meet the Chinese proficiency requirement. And now it is set at a DSE level. But these people, in fact, are nevertheless suitable for holding the post in our eyes. <coughs> if we require them, um, well, actually, it is not much 
reading and writing work to do unless you are at management level. Therefore, the CSB has allowed us, has approved that we can recruit 40 ATOs who may not have the same Chinese proficiency. Next, Kenneth Leung. Thank you, Chair. First, I support extending the post. But I share members' views. The third runway would be completed in 2024 and the airport may be further expanded. I think you should seek to regularize the post as soon as possible. In Annex 1, we have the organization chart. First, I'd like to ask about this DD post. Is it an AO post? And then you have the AD, Air Services and Safety Management. Is that a technical post? Secondly, you quoted that the turnover rate of ATO is only 3 to 4 percent. Can I ask for comparison with the turnover rate at other airports in other places? Number three, I'm not worried about the Chinese proficiency of ATOs because in terms of international civil aviation, what you need is English. In fact, I have reservations. Generally speaking, I think the English standard in Hong Kong has slipped in the past 20 years or so. I have seen cases. I will not quote um, the name of the country, but it's an Asian country. The communication between a pilot and ground staff was problematic because of communication in English and it led to injuries and fatalities. You can look up such cases. I think English is what is important. Well, it would be good if you can read and write Chinese. So I'm asking you, do you have an English proficiency requirement? And what is it? Those three questions. Director, there are in fact, just two questions. Um, making this post permanent and the English standard and actually turnover as well. Oh, sorry. Turnover in other countries. Thank you, Chairman. As for regularizing the post, I think I have already explained why for the time being we only apply for an extension of six years. But we'll certainly conduct a review. As for turnover, And how does this compare with other civil aviation organizations? We don't have a figure. Maybe we can ask other airports and then we can give you the information. As for English proficiency, the ICAO has particular requirements for certain professional grades including ATOs and pilots, there is this English requirement. They have to achieve a certain standard before they can take up these posts. All our ATOs comply with that standard. I can ask another question. Do you have plans to replace your air traffic control system after the third runway is commissioned in 2024. Director. An air traffic system has a lifespan of 15 years. The present system has been in operation for two years, but including testing and training, it has been with us for a few years. Whether we have plans to replace it after 2024, I can definitely say yes. Mr. Christopher Chung. Thank you, Chairman. I support retaining this post of AO. But I remember when we started this post, you did not say you required professional experience in aviation. Now, after these years, don't you think you need to add that in?
because the third runway will be soon commissioned, there will be more throughput, and drones are becoming uh, prevalent, as Mr. You said during the Dine and Wine Festival, it was supposed to be a very good show, but we were hacked and it was very disappointing. Can the CAD do something? Well, it was fortunate that the drones did not fall after the system was hacked. It's just that they could not put up the show. Now, have you thought about regulating the um, maneuvering of drones without authority. Director, thank you for the questions. This is a DD post. The main task is to do administration. His staff are all professional, uh, even the AD as mentioned by a member. Working under this DD, the UAS department is headed by an AD and the entire team is professional. Supposing we are going to make the post permanent, we'll have to take a look to see whether we would still assign an AO to take up the post or whether we should go for a professional. Any follow-up, Mr. Christopher Chang? Uh, Mr. Frank Yik. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I speak uh, to support the proposed retention of this post. Well, some members asked whether the administration would consider making this post permanent. I'm actually in favor of that because Having an administrative officer um, at the post uh, will be able to share um, his or her uh, professional experience. It will help with um, communication and also help with uh, policy making. I really support this idea and I hope that the administration will consider making this post permanent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee. Um, um, anything to add? Um, no, I have nothing to add. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yik, for your uh, support. Well, um, this ends the first round of questions. Second round, um, Mr. Lok Chong Hong. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to follow up on my question earlier. Um, Mr. Lee said, well, although a few thousand people apply um, each year, it is still difficult uh, to identify suitable candidates, um, sometimes because of the lack of Chinese language proficiency. Well, I'm, um, I don't mind too much about this um, proficiency requirement, but does it mean that, um, that um, there is a lack of um, good education system in Hong Kong, and therefore it is difficult for you to identify uh, suitable candidates. And um, what are you looking for um, in the candidates? Uh, do they need um, previous experience or they learn on the job after they have been recruited? Or do they already have adequate training um, in school before? Now oh, may I now may I ask um so to answer the question? Yes. Um thank you. Well let me try to tell you um how we recruit um air candidates for air um traffic control. Well uh, they only need to have completed um DSE and um they are then they would be um eligible to apply uh, because there would be a long period of training for about five to seven years of professional training because they are put on the job. So the training would begin after they have been recruited. Let me try to explain why we are relaxing the Chinese language proficiency requirement. As the director said, well, every uh, every recruitment, uh, we see a few thousand people applying to fight for uh, 20 to 30 places. We're able to identify local candidates. 
uh, but um, when they have uh, been recruited, then we need to look into um, uh, their uh, to see whether they are suitable for it. So we will look into uh, whether they are able to deal with um, emergencies. Um, and to look into how um, they deal with problems. But then we have received responses that, um, yes, sometimes the candidates are local. Um, they're eligible. However, um, they haven't taken the DSE. And their proficiency requirement is lacking because they may be um, ethnic minor minorities. But they may be suitable for the job. So for a for certain people if they have already complied with all the other tests but um, are left out because of the Chinese language proficiency requirement that they do not have a DSE level 2 then we try to relax the um, this um, so that they could also um, be our recruits but we're only very talking about a very small number of people mr. Lok Chong Hong no follow-up all right let us move, um, move on to the next member mr. James Toh thank you chairman I also like to ask about this question so you just now mentioned and DSE Uh, some local students may not like this job and or they may not like the DSE and therefore they choose not to take the DSE. It really depends on the students, the parents, because sometimes they really choose not to take the DSE. But you may think that um, these people that these students are suitable and you could uh, realize their talent and potential. Well, let's say they are not able to uh, be promoted to management level. The proficiency requirement can be relaxed when you recruit them, right? Because they can always choose to study Chinese afterwards. They may even want to study a doctorate degree in Chinese um, after they're on the job, right? Now, if they have um, if they have potential, I think it is better that you retain them. I have seen uh, some jobs in which um, professionals with talent are retained. I think it's more assuring uh, to have a pool of professionals. Well, let's not talk about overseas airports. The mainland is also building many new airports, and they might take away our recruits. They may open up many new job positions and that may take away our talents. I would rather uh, you uh, try to retain our um, talents. I think what you're doing right now um, is really uh, suitable for the way forward. Uh, Deputy Director General, yes, uh, we do try to retain our talents. Well, well, although for certain people we do, we can relax our Chinese language proficiency requirement. They still, we, they don't need to acquire DSE level, but they still need to be able to speak and read Chinese. We would also provide Chinese courses for them to um, help them while on the job. All right. Any other questions from members? If there are no other questions, are you all in support of the proposed retention of this supernumerary post for six years? Uh, Dir Director General, you have heard views of members that uh, this post should actually become permanent. So maybe we could consider this later on. 
well, if there are no other questions, so we approve this proposed retention of post. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next agenda item. Proposed making amending of the subsidiary legislation under the Merchant Shipping Safety Ordinance Cap 369, the Merchant Shipping Sh Prevention and Control of Pollution Ordinance Cap 413, and Merchant Shipping Seafarers Ordinance Cap 478, and amending the Fleet Containers Safety Ordinance Cap 506 for implementation of the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification and Watch Keeping for Seafarers, and the International Convention for Safe Containers of the International Maritime Organization. Now we have with us today Ms. Louisa Yen, Acting Deputy Secretary for Transport and Housing. Mr. Choi Chi Chun, Assistant Director of La Multilateral Policy. And Mr. Loi Kem Lung, Chief of Maritime Policy, both from the Marine Department. Uh, the administration will share with us through PowerPoint the six uh, subsidiary legislations. And um, also on the um, or, um, ordinances that I have just mentioned. All right, who would take us through the paper? Ms. Yen, please. Thank you. Oh, I will go through this PowerPoint very briefly. I hope that we're able to amend. Um, um, these and um, put these six legislative proposals to incorporate into local legislation. Well, uh, one is the STCW Convention, which is the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeper for Seafarers, which is to try to incorporate um, new two new amendments into our local legislation. One is the training requirements on ships using low flashpoint fuels. There is an increasing number of ships using low flashpoint fuels. And uh, so seafarers uh, need to know um, how to deal with the bunkering storage and securing of the fuse. And therefore, the IMO has made it compulsory for seafarers working on those ships to receive relevant training starting from January 1st, 2017. And uh, for masters, engineering officers, and officers with immediate responsibility, then they're required to obtain an advanced training certificate in addition to a basic one. The second one is um, on um, concerning seafarers working on passenger ships uh, because in 2012 uh, there was a serious cruise accident in Italy in 2012 leading to the death of 30 odd people. Um, there are now more and more cruise ships. Therefore, uh, starting from June 2018, um, all uh, masters, officers, and uh, and qualified rating designated to assist passengers in emergency situations must include uh, training in crowd management. In Hong Kong, the Maritime Services Training Institute offers crowd management training for seafarers working on passenger ships. Um, the second proposal is safe operation of fleet containers. Um, this is the International Convention for Safe Containers, the Container Convention. And um, this uh, seeks to incorporate requirements of the two IMO resolutions that came into force internationally in 2012 and 2014. All containers used for international transport must comply with certain requirements. Um, this includes uh, where it was manufactured and whether it is um, uh, have um, is uh, valid. And it also includes um, 
um, terms and uh, terms dimensions and units. And so the IMO has required that the physical dimensions and units be marked on the containers. And so, uh, starting from uh, containers um, that are to be used from January first, twenty twelve, there are specifications for containers with limited stacking ability. And these, with limited stacking abilities, would containers would be arranged at the top of a stack of containers so that it will be more safe. The other requirement is the alignment of physical dimensions and units, uh, which is what I've said earlier about the uniform set of terms, dimensions, and units to facilitate the international transport of containers. So um, the IMO has required that um, the that uh, terms uh, such as uh, weight should um, mass should be replaced with um, weight should be replaced with mass and stacking weight would be replaced with stacking load. And so uh, to incorporate this requirement to local legislation will amend the interpretation section of the container ordinance and will need to go through a third reading. The third proposal is a carriage of solid bulk cargoes. So um, this is uh, in relation to the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea. And um, requirements um, concerning the carriage of solid bulk cargoes uh, would include um, uh, what includes whether it is uh, dangerous, whether there is a likelihood of shifting moisture content, whether it is hazardous, has, um, hazardous because if there's a likelihood of shifting, it may pose um, danger and risk to the ship. And so um, starting from January 1st, 2019, the IMO has made it mandatory for shippers to declare an additional piece of information about whether the cargoes being shipped would be harmful to marine environment. And if yes, then they will need to um, declare this case. And we will also need to include this into our local legislation. The fourth legislative proposal is about prevention of air pollution from ships. And we are talking about the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships or MARPOL. The proposal is that in the world, there are four emission control areas. When ships go into ECAs, they will have to submit to more stringent control standards. When ships go into ECAs, they will use another engine. They will switch off the engine and then they will start another one in order to navigate in ECAs. The IMO stipulates that the dates and everything else should be included in the log so that the regulating authority of the port will know whether the vessels have complied with their requirements when they check the vessels on board. And then another one is about the collection of fuel oil consumption data. It is said that this would help setting the future maximum limit. From the 1st of January 2019, ocean-going vessels will have to collect fuel oil consumption data. And these would have to be supported to the port authorities or the classification societies. When the data of ocean-going vessels are collected, these will be submitted to the IMO, which will review the data and analyze them. Later on, if a maximum limit has to be set, then there can be an objective basis to do so. This will also be entrenched in local legislation. The fifth one, prevention of pollution by garbage from ships. Uh, it is still the MARPOL. OGVs may discharge garbage into the sea and in fact, this is strictly regulated by the IMO, and some garbage has to be treated first before it can be discharged. And we are using a direct method of directing our local legislation to the 2012 guidelines of the IMO. 
If the IMO guidelines are updated, we can easily resort to them. But then the IMO actually updated the re relevant regulation and it has become a bylaw. Therefore, we will have to change accordingly and we will have to show that it has become an annex uh, so that we comply with the IMO requirements. And also, as to what garbage can be discharged into the sea by OGVs, the day, time and the quantity, all that is regulated. And in this round of updating, some new information has to be included. <coughs> and therefore, in the aviation log, uh, such information has to be included. The last one, oil pollution. The relevant convention is still marble. What OGVs can discharge into the sea and how oil sludge has to be treated uh, this is again regulated by the MARPO, and now we use a direct reference approach, and that is in our legislation, we directly um, ask people to look up the MARPO regulation. But this time around, the connection with the pump is specifically provided for, and these new technical requirements will be written into local laws and then we will again direct readers to the MAPO guidelines so that our local legislation will be aligned with the international requirements. We hope to take up all these legislative amendment proposals in 2019. Apart from the safety use of containers, the others would be done through negative vetting, but the uh, stacking ability limit will involve the changing or amendment of principal legislation. There are two members who would like to say something, so two, uh, five minutes each, Mr. Frankie Yick. Thank you, Chairman. These legislative proposals are just to entrench international guidelines which have been implemented or will be implemented into local legislation. I haven't heard much from the industry. I'd just like to know how many more there are, how many more are standing in line so they can be entrenched in local legislation. Before the end of the year, we will submit two more conventions. We hope to do so in December. And then between January and May next year, we may submit four proposals, which will relate to four conventions so that we can align closely with international guidelines. As you have heard, uh, we are looking into 2019 and 2020 and what new conventions will be implemented. We are working on different fronts. The IMO passes numerous resolutions every year, and we want to be as close as to them as possible. Okay, you are not really lagging behind now. As you know, we are the fourth largest shipping registry in the world, and we should align ourselves as closely to the international conventions as possible. I hope you will continue to work hard. Anything else? If not, Michael, look. Thank you, Chair. A very simple question. The paper shows that using low flash point fuels would mean you need to have special training before you can do it. I'd like to know whether you have got the training programs in place. And is that going to be one off or that people have to seek licenses from time to time? And if uh, it is the latter case, what is the frequency? of license examination. Director, thank you for the question. With regard to the qualification of personnel using low flash point fuels, we provide courses at the Maritime Services Training Institute. They are still getting prepared. 
since this is a requirement in international conventions. We can accept qualification from authorized training institute in other signatories. The convention also stipulates that every five years, the seafarers have to come back for a refreshment course, refresher course, actually. Mr. Stephen Ho, we consulted the industry about this paper. Basically, they say they are not exactly affected, but they just like the administration to clarify one concern they have. Is it that you ad attend every meeting of the IMO? Mr. Ho, the Marine Department has an AD who is resident in London at the IMO, uh, attending all meetings. So you know what is happening. Well, yes. We know all the <coughs> resolutions of the IMO. Secondly, the direct reference approach, you mentioned that twice meaning if the IMO updates a certain list, you do not have to change Hong Kong legislation. But when the IMO actually updates a certain resolution, how can consultation be done? Because in Hong Kong, it seems there is a, an automatic implementation mode. I think this is a little risky. We don't know what the IMO is going to endorse in future. And your AD, resident at IMO, may have overlooked the possible impact on Hong Kong. I can answer the question and then the MD can say something. When we go for a direct reference approach, since we like to align as closely as possible with IMO, we like to go for this approach. But we would only do this with regard to technical requirements. Mr. Ho asked about the possible risk. The IMO may endorse something, but the industry in Hong Kong may want to object. Well, actually, before resolutions are passed by the IMO, it will conduct consultation. Mr. Choi was saying that the AD of MD resident at London refers the new resolutions of the IMO whenever the IMO proposes it, and we will consult the industry. And at the annual conferences, the ship owners and other stakeholders will fly to London with us together to attend the annual conference. And resolutions passed by the IMO are not immediately implemented. There is always a two-year grace period where ship owners and classification societies can adapt to the new requirements. Maybe Mr. Choi would like to say something. Yes, please. Before we amend the law, we will consult the industry at different meetings. We need to tell them what the amendments will be and we'll listen to them. Chairman, I'd like to make a proposal to the administration. In the past, uh, we would have to make our own legislation. I hope you will consult the industry. But now, with your new approach, the consultation period would be shortened. What about users who are not classification societies? They may not understand the amendments too well. I would say that whenever the IMO proposes amendments, please come back early. Please do not only attend a meeting together at the end of the year. Use a multifarious and transparent way to consult the industry before you make your comment at the IMO. This is just uh, a proposal. Can you arrange that? Well, yes, yes. The
basic thing is to inform Mr. Frankie Yick and Mr. Stephen Ho. Well, that is one way to do it. But we may not be able to be in touch with uh, all the people. But this is the responsibility of the SARG, of course. Any other questions? If not, will we support these amendments for our legislation? Thank you very much. Paper endorsed. Oh, we are quick. Anything under AOB? If you don't have anything, the meeting is adjourned. I'll remind you that on the 19th of December, we'll have our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you.